Yeah, after being carefully explained how to turn it on, I then just actually totally failed to turn it on. Um, all right, so yeah. So now, now we've got the second of, of the day's uh, tutorials. Uh, Stefan Schuster will be talking about um, flux balance analysis. This is a, you know, a, a rather different topic to what we had this morning, but um, I think it will be super useful and interesting. So thank you, Stefan. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's really a pleasure for me to give this tutorial. Um, yeah, I was asked to uh, introduce myself a little bit. Uh, so I studied uh, biophysics at Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany. Uh, at that time, it was East Germany. And uh, so, uh, Humboldt University was on the eastern side. And uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, and my, uh, then I did a PhD at the same university. My supervisor was Reinhard Heinrich. Maybe you know the name. Um, and then I did postdocs in Bordeaux and Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, it was with Hans Westerhoff. And then I came back to Berlin. And then in 2003, I was appointed a professor in bioinformatics at Jena University, where I'm still working. Um, so as you certainly know, FBA st stands for Flux Balance Analysis. And um, I think there are two main starting points for developing um, this uh, analysis. Uh, one was that uh, many kinetic parameters in metabolism are unknown, as we all know. Yeah, um, for thousands of reactions, often it's not known. Uh, as all, not all the parameters are known, especially for maximal velocities, because they depend on enzyme concentrations, and they of course change due to uh, gene regulation. And uh, actually, a second starting point, I will come to that, uh, back to that later, is uh, in biotechnology, we are often interested in calculating what can at best be expected. Yeah? What is, for example, the, the, the optimal yield we can reach in a biotransformation? I will come back to that. And yeah, and then the question was, what conclusions can be drawn from the information on enzymes that is available? Yeah? Um, also if, um, uh, uh, also much better than Michaelis Menten constants and maximal velocities uh, is, uh, are known the stoichiometry of the reaction and also in most cases uh, the directionality yeah? so whether reactions are reversible or irreversible and if they are reversible then in which direction they work and so let's start with a very simple uh, example um, namely yeah um, this uh, system made of four reactions and um, let's assume we have measured uh, the first, uh, the rate of the first reaction. An uh, uh, interesting question is which other rates can be calculated? Uh, and you see uh, at steady state. So, and, and um, as in most cases, we assume steady state conditions. I mean, there are extensions like dynamic FBA, but usually, as at first, FBA is at steady state, uh, like metabolic control analysis or elementary flux modes are also assume uh, steady state. So, and then, um, uh, although reactions one and four are not adjacent um, to each other, uh, reaction, uh, the rate of reaction four can be calculated because it's actually the same as reaction one uh, at steady state, where, steady state, whereas um, the rates two and three cannot be calculated um, unless additional constraints are included. So, and this is actually a typical question in MFA, which is metabolic flux analysis. So, yeah, we should distinguish metabolic flux analysis and flux balance analysis. And um, so, yeah, and here is interesting that um, uh, in this case, where only reaction one is known, um, also the, the rate of reaction one, uh, it's a so called underdetermined system. Uh, the, uh, the equation system is underdetermined. If we also had measured um, rate number four, then due to some measurement error, probably it's not exactly the same as rate number one. Then the system is overdetermined, yeah. Then, but then by some uh, minimizing uh, the square of deviation, uh, we can, um, 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 yeah, take uh, in principle the arithmetic mean of one and four. Um, and interestingly, then the system is at the same time underdetermined and overdetermined. Yeah? That's also interesting. Um, so, and then um, a main assumption in uh, FBA is that. Uh, that uh, networks have um, maximized the molar yield. Yeah? Yield means the product to substrate ratio. Yeah? Also the idea of FBA is what additional yeah, optimality criterion uh, we can include to calculate the unknown fluxes. And whether this assumption is um, justified, this is a, a matter of debate until now, but at least it's a plausible assumption 
um, we can say, for example, if um, reaction two is driven by ATP hydrolysis and reaction three then uh, gives rise to inorganic phosphate, so it, this is essentially a futile cycle, then uh, yeah, it, it would be not good for the cell if uh, too much ATP is wasted by this futile cycle. So in the ideal case, we can say reaction three is completely downregulated. Um, so rate is zero, and then we can calculate then uh, one equals two equals four, other reaction rate of one equals that of two equals that of four. And because then the um, molar yield uh, of um, product synthesis, as I have not written the product, but there's some product um, in terms of ATP is maximized. Or the other way around, ATP consumption is minimized. And so, and mathematically, this means, uh, also a, since we consider a yield um, is a product to substrate ratio, so we maximize the ratio of v, V4 over V2, yeah, subject to uh, the steady state condition that V4 equals um, V2 minus V3, yes, the steady state for S2, and let's assume all reactions are irreversible, so all of them are uh, non-negative, in other cases, only some of them are irreversible. And then uh, I think it's clear that the solution is that V1 equals V4 equals V4, uh, V2 equals V4 and V3 equals zero. Um, so now we can write this in more general terms, uh, namely a yield is a, is a ratio of linear combinations of fluxes and uh, Mig are the stoichiometric coefficients Usually they are written n, but uh, since um, we consider product to substrate ratios, we should consider the stoichiometric coefficients of the external metabolites here, and I wrote them by m, whereas for the internal metabolites, I use n. Um, and yeah, and this could be a linear combination because, for example, it could be that ATP is consumed in several reactions or um, a, a certain substrate, maybe uh, a certain product let's say some amino acid is um, produced on several ways, um, then we have a linear combination, but very often it's just one rate. And um, yeah, and then um, here the minus is just written for mathematical reasons because uh, substrates have a negative stoichiometric coefficient and in order to, that the yield is positive, we should compensate and write a minus. So then we have linear side constraints, namely for the irreversible reactions, um, the rate is non-negative, and then we have the famous steady state condition n times v equals zero. So it's the stoichiometry matrix times the vector of fluxes uh, equals the null vector. So whereas the objective function a priori is nonlinear, no? this is important, also if we consider yields. Um, so, but very often in papers on FBA, a normalization is used. No? The people ask, um, what is the best um, product yield per mole of glucose, for example. Also how many moles of ATP? For example, as he, uh, in the simple system, I considered ATP consumption, but in most cases, ATP production is um, considered. So I could ask how many moles of ATP are produced per mole of glucose. Yeah? And per mole of glucose means uh, I assume that the um, consumption is equals one. And so, and then, of course, this ratio simplifies to just a linear combination. So then uh, it simplifies to a linear optimization problem. And this makes it very appealing because now I have a linear, um, um, linear program. Um, ah, yeah, and, and sometimes also upper limits are um, considered, for example, maximal velocities or some uh, protein capacity. Um, and the irreversibility constraint is written uh, uh, like this. Sometimes uh, also the lower limit is uh, consider as a non-negative number, so then is v i min larger than v uh, smaller than v i smaller than v i max. Um, but th these are also linear constraints, so no problems. We still have a linear program, and yeah, and this picture is of course probably too simple for you, but um, to to, to uh, recall you that linear programs are of course very simple um, or very easy to solve. Um, so um, because the the maximum or minimum always lies on the boundary uh, of, of the admissible region. So here, this just for a hypothetical um, example, or in two dimensions, as if we have two variables, and then the third variable is the uh, dependent variable, um, the objective function, then again, we have a, a 
also we have a po uh, polygon in this case, and higher dimension could be polyhedron, uh, and the maximum is a vertex um, of this um, polyhedron. Uh, in some cases, uh, there could be two vertices which are equivalent, and then, of course, uh, the entire line uh, between them is also optimal. Um, this is, uh, causes sometimes problems because not every LP solver, uh, a linear programming solver, then really gives two solutions. So then sometimes only one of the points is given. One should uh, take care of that. So, and yeah, linearity makes this approach very appealing. And um, yeah, uh, the, the first papers I know of uh, uh, with such approaches are from 1986. I will comment, them, comment on them in a second. Uh, and then uh, later many papers by Bernard Paulson's lab in San Diego appeared about it. So therefore uh, often Bernard is uh, considered the father of FBA, but in fact there are two earlier papers. Um, yeah, and normalization is often made tacitly. Um, and, and therefore, it often appears that um, yeah, if this is normalized, that not uh, rather than a yield, a rate or linear combination of rates is maximized. Yeah? And therefore, often in, F, in the F, FPA literature, it's written uh, ATP production rate or growth rate um, is maximized. And this is an important point I will discuss in some detail. Um, and yeah, and then due to the usage of constraints, the field is often called constraint-based modeling. Um, but actually, constraint-based modeling includes something more, for example, also elementary mode analysis, uh, uh, which is maybe sometimes also ca called pathway analysis. Um, there's e even a conference series called metabolic pathway analysis. Um, yeah, these are um, to some extent equivalent, to some extent overlapping terms. Okay, yeah, let's speak about the origins of FBA. So um, one of these early papers was by uh, Watson. Uh, I think he worked here in, um, uh, in the UK uh, in uh, a journal, uh, Computer Applications in the Biosciences. Um, and uh, his idea was to minimize, um, but, but actually minimize or maximize doesn't really, um, um, is not really a difference because you can, uh, if you have, if you maximize a certain function, then it's equivalent to minimizing the negative of this function. Or you could uh, swap the signs of the uh, coefficients cj. And, uh, and he explained it by, um, so that uh, the free energy cost of reaction j uh, or, or the linear combination of the free energy cost should be minimized. So it was more a thermodynamic uh, point of view that the, the cell should um, use the free energy in an economic, economic way. Uh, then a side condition, which is similar to the steady state condition, but if you have a constant input or output fluxes, you can have as a sum of the uh, elements in this vector on the right hand side can be non-zero. And uh, he didn't use the term FBA. Uh, this would be interesting to, uh, I didn't have the time to look in the early literature when the term FBA was used for the first time, probably by Bernard Paulson, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, then uh, in the same year, uh, independently, a paper uh, also in the UK, namely at the uh, uh, Oxford Brookes University uh, by David Fell and uh, Rankin Small um, was published in Biochemical Journal. And, um, and their um, research question was to calculate how much uh, glucose um, is needed at least to synthesize one mole of triglycerides. Uh, so this is related to this question I mentioned uh, in biotechnology or, or even beyond uh, so in general biochemistry, it's interesting to calculate maximal yields, no? also to, to know at best uh, how much uh, triglycerides can be produced from glucose or the other way around, how much glucose at least are needed to um, synthesize triglycerides or amino acids or penicillin or whatever. Uh, and they considered ATP coming from respiration, which makes it mathematically more complicated because you know in respiration there are yeah, complicated processes and the yield is actually not so clear uh, until now how many moles ATP are produced in respiration from one mole of glucose. Um, in, in older textbooks, it's written 36 or even 38, but then it was 
reduced more and more. I think now it's about 30 or 30 points something. Um, yeah, and yeah, and um, importantly, they calculated this maximum yield without saying that this is really achieved in living cells. Yeah? Um, this is just what can at best be expected. Um, yeah, they, interestingly, although they phrased the problem as minimization, but as I told you, this is just a well, matter of sign. Um, and and then um, uh, David Fell told me later that uh, they found an, a mistake in the paper and later they corrected the numerical results by uh, using elementary modes, which is another method for um, dealing with these questions. Yeah, and then um, one of the early papers by uh, Bernard Paulson is in 1993. Um, in Journal of Theoretical Biology, uh, they um, considered E. coli, and um, they were also interested in maximizing the production of particular metabolites and also cofactors. So, for example, how much ATP per mole of glucose or how much NADH per mole of glucose, and and they really uh, dealt with yields. So the term yield is repeatedly used in the paper, um, in contrast to growth rate. I will come to that, and and also yeah um, they calculated the optimal flux distribution without saying that it's really achieved. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, and then uh, uh, later Bernard Parson and co-workers uh, refined and extended the method. No, I sh showed some uh, here, a lot of papers here, uh, Edwards and Parson, Ibarra, and, and, um, and until now there are, of course, many more papers. Um, and um, yeah, applied it to various systems of increasing complexity and coined the term FBA. Um, and yeah, and then um, several success stories were published, uh, for example, in strain design, uh, in the outcome of the prediction of uh, evolution experiments, you know, so E. coli was um, evolved art artificially, or gene deletion studies, you know, what happens if uh, a gene is uh, deleted. Um, actually, they are also about, also these are mainly studies on uh, studying changes. No? We have a, we call it a wild type, then we change something in the experiment and we want to predict what, uh, what is the outcome. Uh, and FBA can be used for, also for that, no? because you can compare the um, prediction of this optimization problem for both situations. Um, there are also other uh, approaches like um, Room and MoMA, you may have heard, uh, have heard about it. Uh, so it's really large, lit uh, so very abundant literature. It's really difficult to, um, to follow all that. Yeah, but uh, also caveats appeared. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, I, I confess my talk will be a little bit critical also about FBA, um, but, um, uh, but on the other hand, of course, I uh, also say that there are many success stories, but I think it's, very relevant in, or appropriate in science no, to discuss the pros and cons. Um, yeah, a, a, an important question, of course, is what is the objective function? Also, what is the, um, or, or what is the target um, product, so to speak, the biochemical product? Uh, and um, in most cases, it's uh, either ATP production or biomass production. Yeah? And biomass is a linear combination of many fluxes, no, because we need amino acids, lipids, carbohydrates. Um, and uh, this is often written as a sum over CJ, VJ, like in the Watson paper, actually. Um, and, but of course, this involves a, a, a many parameters, namely the coefficients CJ, which are not always known. Yeah, so, and um, um, often these um, are taken for measurements on dry mass. No? So, when, for example, dry mass of E. coli is um, uh, analyzed, how much lipids are involved, how much of the 20 amino acids, and so on. Uh, and for amino acids, one can use um, a rough estimate by considering the genome, because then you can look at the frequency of, of the different codons and, or codon groups for specific amino acids. This, however, imply or requires that um, all um, genes are um, expressed to this, uh, uh, the same extent, which is, of course, not true. No? Some genes are more expressed than others. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, ATP or biomass, but could also be other um, target metabolites, so to speak. Uh, 
So now coming back to this um, very relevant question, what is really maximized uh, in, in FPA? Is it a rate or yield? Yeah, and there is also very abundant literature, um, uh, also from other sides, uh, also in game theory or optimization and so, um, because there are two very important um, optimization principles, namely maximum flux versus maximum molar yield, or we can say economy versus speed, so to speak. Um, and in many, but not all situations, these two criteria contradict each other. A very famous example is fermentation versus respiration. Yeah, uh, for example, baker's yeast can use uh, uh, respiration uh, no, to degrade glucose to carbon dioxide and water, and then the yield uh, in baker's yeast is even lower than 30. I think it's, I think it's 16 only in, in yeast. In E. coli, it's 26, so it also depends on the uh, organism. And uh, whereas fermentation, it's well-known glycolysis, has a yield of two. Um, or maybe three, I think, if, um, if ethanol rather than um, lactate is secreted, but is very low. And it's much lower than in respiration. On the other hand, fermentation has a much higher rate. And the reason is that, um, uh, okay, there's also, also interesting question what the reason is, but let's say the, the first observation is that um, um, glycolysis is a much shorter pathway. No? It needs less enzymes and, um, and therefore, so to speak, the, the resistance in the pathway is much lower than in a long respiration where you have the TCA cycle and the uh, respiratory chain. And so therefore it's, um, as it, even if you multiply the low yield by this, uh, by the rate, it's still more, it gives more ATP per time than, um, than respiration. Yeah? And therefore we should distinguish Fermentation has the advantage that it gives uh, much ATP per time, other more than respiration, but respiration has the advantage that it gives more ATP per mole of glucose. Yeah, so this is economy versus speed. And yeah, so one can uh, visualize this uh, by, or a nice analogy is uh, comparing cars. So this is the famous Trabant from East Germany. So uh, this was certainly not um, optimized for speed, but maybe for economy. So uh, 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 also the minimum uh, amount of uh, gas per 100 kilometers, whereas a racing car uh, is um, optimized for speed, and then it doesn't matter how much gas it, it consumes. Um, and so this uh, can be maybe compared to bacteria uh, or yeast. Um, yeah, it can also be uh, uh, regarded from a game theoretical perspective, ne, because there is competition between uh, microorganisms. And now, if two cells uh, compete for the same uh, substrate, uh, glucose, uh, they can uh, choose different strategies, no? respiration or fermentation. Um, as it's a bit more complicated because actually glycolysis is to a large extent part of respiration. Also, also respiration first uh, uses glycolysis and then fermentation is so to speak glycolysis plus one uh, step leading to either uh, lactate or ethanol or acetate and, and secreting it. Um, so, and now it, it would be better for both of them to use um, respiration because then the resource lasts longer. Um, on the other hand, if one of them switches to fermentation, it has a short-term advantage. No? It can, produces more ATP per time, so it can outcompete the, the competitor. And therefore, also from the game theoretical perspective, is a sort of prisoner's dilemma no? because um, um, then both of them probably switch to fermentation in order not to lose the competition, uh, although it's not the optimal uh, situation. Yeah, then um, uh, there are, of course, many chemical examples. For example, the group, the group of Bastoisic in Amsterdam. Uh, technician is not here. But then, then probably the, the virtual audience cannot hear me. Yeah, now I unmuted it again, now it works. <laughs> um, so um, this is also an interesting uh, example, um, namely Lactobacillus planta plantarum has uh, also two strategies, so to speak, homolactic fermentation and mixed. And now it seems to work. I, I, I muted and unmuted again, 
Ja. Okay, yeah. Um, and so, and FBA, if it uh, is written in a way to maximize yield, uh, also ATP per glucose, then it would predict a pure mixed acid fermentation. Yeah, because yeah, mixed acid fermentation gives three ATP per mole of glucose. Uh, however, uh, lactobacillus uses a mixture of both pathways. Uh, and, and this is often uh, observed that not the, um, the high yield uh, pathway is used in a pure form. Or if we compare different yeasts, um, uh, so as a baker's yeast, Cerevisiae, uh, um, uses fermentation even under aerobic conditions in agreement what i said before due to the competition also um, it doesn't use all the oxygen so um, but it actually it uses uh, so-called respiro fermentation as a mixture of both uh, if sufficient glucose is available from the game theoretical point of view we can say it behaves in a selfish way um, and it is also done by other yeasts like saccharomyces baianus sheets of saccharomyces pombe and so on uh, but there are also other yeasts, for example, Picia and Yarovia lipolytica. Uh, they are non-fermentative, uh, so they always use respiration. Um, so maybe we can say, but this is a speculation, that they have evolved further in evolution to a co cooperative behavior. No? They, they the cells cooperate with each other to use the resource in a more economic way. Um, so they somehow they have uh, managed to escape the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and the third group of yeasts, uh, with these two examples, are capable of um, using fermentation, uh, but do so practically only under anaerobic conditions, no? which makes sense. So if, if, no, if no oxygen, then they use fermentation, and with oxygen, they use respiration. So it's also cooperative. Whereas the second group would, would um, die if there is no oxygen, yeah, because they're non-fermentative. Um, another example are demorphic fun fungi. Um, like uh, Candida albicans, uh, which is, for example, uh, studied in Jena uh, at that institute, um, is a pathogenic fungus, and um, in it, it can exist in two different forms, unicellular and multicellular. And this is an interesting observation in the unicellular form. It uses mainly fermentation and in the multicellular form, respiration, which makes sense, so to speak, for, from the population point of view, uh, because uh, the, in a multicellular form, the cells should not compete with each other. But it's difficult to explain by evolutionary theory because then it would imply a sort of group selection. Eh? But in principle, even the cells in such a hyphae and such a filament uh, could compete with each other. Ah, okay. Then maybe I'm also guilty. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, also from evolutionary game theory, uh, first guess is that ATP production flux rather than ATP yield is maximum uh, no, because of uh, competition. Um, so, and therefore, the, the prediction, at least from the earlier, let's say the earlier FBA, which considered yield, are not always correct. Um, as a, let's say they, they are correct, but they only predict the best situation, and they, one cannot claim that it's really achieved in, in, the, in the living cell. However, it's a question of site constraints. Yeah, uh, so, yeah I will come back to that. Um, yeah, and um, unfortunately, in the literature, it's often unclear what is really maximized, yeah, rate or yield. Um, so if, if you look in papers on FBA, then authors write biomass production is maximized or ATP production. Yeah, but what does production mean? Is it production per time, also production rate or production yield? Yeah, so I think this should be made clear in, in, in the literature. And yeah, um, Let's speak again about this normalization. And here I have another uh, illustrative example. Uh, and here actually ATP uh, production is, um, uh, is considered. In principle, we should also have uh, stoichiometric coefficients, but uh, let's uh, say they are now. Yeah, in principle, 
it would be better to write here, for example, 30, 30 ATP, no? so in respiration. Um, and um, yeah, but I think the example also works with just stoichiometric coefficients of one. Yeah, so also here is one and here is one, but we can make it more correct. So and so essentially we have two reactions where ATP can be produced, for example, glycolysis and respiration, and then we have an excretion of this metabolite, which could, for example, for example, be pyruvate or lactate. Yeah, and you know in fermentation it's excreted. So and now let's say uh, V1 is normalized, uh, so let's say it's constant. Uh, then, um, interestingly, then maximization of yield is equivalent to maximization of ATP production rate, no? namely in this pathway, also if we uh, don't use this. And ah, yeah, and um, I forgot to say that um, because in linear programs, the solution is achieved on the boundary of the admissible region, always some reactions are not used. No? Um, uh, and this is a uh, observed both in FBA and also in elementary mode analysis, no, that some enzymes are not used in, in the optimal state, which is a question whether this is true in living cells, but here it is so. And yeah, and here we can see this, no, so this is not used. Um, so, and then uh, both yield and rate are maximized. It's clear because if we normalize V1, then the denominator is equal to one and then maximizing the, the ratio is the same as maximizing the numerator. Uh, however, um, often we have um, not a constant uh, input rate, but, but upper limits on the input rate and also on the other rates. No? For example, also this should here um, indicate a michaelis menten kinetics, so to speak. No? Also this is the upper limit, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, so, and then of course, respiration has a lower capacity than glycolysis, no? because here we have the processes in the membrane, respiratory chain, and so. And this makes it now more complicated uh, with these uh, side constraints, um, because um, maximization of yield then again leads to um, V2 equals zero. However, ATP production rate can be further increased, no? because if we now also use V2, then some lactate is secreted, Therefore, glycolysis can run faster and therefore more ATP per time can be produced. No? And now if we uh, say that we maximize ATP production rate under these side constraints, uh, then we really don't maximize yield, but we, we maximize rate. Yeah? So, and also with appropriate side constraints, we really can maximize rate. No? Also, uh, so in that sense, it's a good property of FBA. It can do both. It can, by appropriate constraints, we can maximize yield and we can maximize uh, rate. Yeah, also this is, I think, a very illustrative or instructive example where you can see, as it's, it's a minimal model, so to speak, of fermentation and respiration. You could modify the stoichiometric coefficients if you want. Now you can see that uh, if the uh, if respiration has a lower capacity than fermentation, then it makes sense to use an excretion reaction in addition, although it does not produce ATP, um, in order to increase the overall ATP production. Yeah, then is a point which is rarely discussed in the literature. Uh, I just want to branch, uh, mention it briefly. Uh, in principle, we have interdependence via concentrations, and which is often neglected in FBA. Namely, the usage of this excretion reaction, in addition, changes the concentration of the intermediate S. No? Also, the faster this is, the lower will S be at steady state. And this can have an effect on, on the respiration reaction. No? Also this would be then pyruvate, no? it's the branching metabolite. Um, and so I would say this normalization uh, disguises some kinetic effects. No? We cannot neglect kinetics completely. But okay, let's forget it uh, and <laughs> just consider um, these rates and the uh, stoichiometric analysis. Um, yeah, also by choosing appropriate constraints, rates rather um, Oh, rather than yield, I forgot this, rather than yield, can be maximized by FBA even at suboptimal yields. Uh, so in this skeleton model of respiration fermentation, we would need these two 
um, inequalities. Uh, for V2, I think it's not so important. And yeah, and then in many papers of FBA, growth rate is maximized. Yeah? Also, also in Paulson's papers, uh, also in the later papers, and by many other people. Um, and yeah, and here I must confess, I have not completely understood the mathematics yet, uh, so we can discuss it also during this week. Uh, I think at least two constraints are then needed. If you have only one constraint, then it's normalization. But in order to maximize rate, um, we need at least two, either equality or inequality constraints. Um, yeah, and in the literature, it was really a heavy debate uh, um, what is really um, maximized rate or yield. Uh, so I, uh, together with uh, Thomas Pfeiffer um, and David Fell, um, whom I mentioned, uh, we wrote a paper in 2008 uh, where we wrote that flux balance analysis, oh, this, uh, this was FPA in parenthesis, flux balance analysis, is based on the optimality principle of maximizing the molar yield. So at that point <laughs> in time, I understood it as if it's maximizing, always maximizing yield, which is not true. <laughs> I have understood by now. <laughs> um, and maximization of molar yield is by no means a universal uni evolutionary principle. Uh, so this was our criticism that we said in the living cell, it's not uh, uh, always so, for example, in Baker's yeast. And also the group of Bas Toysink in Amsterdam um, advocated this uh, view. So they, for example, they wrote FDA predicts flux distributions that provide the maximal yield on the limiting nutrient and does not actually predict kinetic rates. Um, an opposing view uh, was published by Steffen Klamt in Magdeburg together with um, colleagues in Austria. Um, and they wrote uh, yields are ratios of rates, which I showed, I agree. And hence, the optimization of yields as nonlinear objective functions um, is not possible um, with current flux balance analysis techniques. So, the, uh, as a first, they just wrote it's not possible. And then I was a reviewer of the paper and I said, no, it's not true. Of course, they can. And then they uh, inserted uh, this um, uh, statement under arbitrary linear constraints, uh, whatever that means. Um, so, maybe it's, it's still not completely clear, I think. But now, yeah, but in a sense, they are right that um, uh, also rates can be maximized, but I think they were too critical about the yield point of view. So I think both is possible. And, and then also later, Bas Toysing uh, changed his view and he wrote um, FBA with one constraint, select the maximal yield AFM. Um, but this logic cannot be readily extended to cases with multiple constraints, no? as I said earlier. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, and then uh, it's also an interesting point that FBA selects elementary flux modes. Um, and it, it then, uh, as if, I think if you have only one constraint, that is, then it's just one elementary mode, for example, fermentation. But if you have several constraints, then it's a linear combination of, um, of elementary modes. Yeah, as I said, since the optimum is reached on the boundary of the admissible flux region, and some enzymes are not used. And um, yeah, and now, uh, maybe a bit late, but uh, probably most of you know already this concept, um, um, elementary flux modes, uh, I should explain this. Um, so the, uh, the idea is if you have, this is now an artificial uh, system, or a hypothetical system, and uh, the external metabolites are indicated in red. No? So these are the sources and sinks, and the blue metabolites are the internal ones, and they should be at steady state, as a fulfill the steady state condition, so that production equals consumption. For example, two units come, two units of flux come in here, and then these carry one unit, so then two is one plus one, so it's at steady state. And so, and the flux mode is essentially a, a relative flux distribution. Yeah? So, and they are, uh, it, this flux mode is non-elementary because it can be decomposed into two simpler modes. Ne? This is the sum of these two. And they are elementary because they cannot be further decomposed. Ne? If we delete one enzyme, then the steady state is impossible. Any, there's no steady state possible anymore. Uh, and so, and then, for example, here, if we consider glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway, now um, another example, so no respiration, just glycolysis and pentose phosphate pathway, then the system gives rise to seven elementary modes, including this uh, futile cycle here. Um, 
And yeah, and also in elementary modes, or e even more so in elementary modes, we never claimed that this is, uh, also that a pure elementary mode is realized in a living cell. No? We just wanted to decompose the observed flux distribution into the simplest pathway, so to speak. But in, in which percentage they are contributing is, is another question. This can only be answered by kinetics. And, no, and then, for example, we didn't say that the futile cycle occurs or does not occur, but potentially it can occur, so to speak. Yeah? And so, and then uh, the blue mode is glycolysis, and the green mode is what is often called the pentose phosphate cycle, you know, because it's uh, the other way around, <laughs> cycling. And, um, and an interesting property of elementary modes is that it ma also maximizes yields. Also, each mode maximizes another yield, so to speak. Also, glycolysis maximizes. Um, ATP um, production. Uh, here's no respiration involved, therefore glycolysis has the highest yield. No, it's higher than, for example, the yellow mode, which is a combination of the pentose phosphate pathway and the lower part of glycolysis. Um, and the green mode, as a pentose phosphate uh, cycle, uh, maximizes the NADPH over ATP, uh, over glucose, um, NADPH over glucose yield. And again, we see that in each element remote, some reactions are not used. Um, um, yeah, and um, there are pros and cons for both approaches. Uh, FBA, of course, has the big advantage that it scales very well with the size of the system, né? because a linear program can also be solved for large uh, systems, ex except for some pathological cases where it can even, uh, then it even scales exponentially, but normally it scales very well, whereas uh, elementary modes are hard to calculate for large systems or even impossible. Um, so there is some, uh, some limit on the system size, so to speak. On the other hand, elementary modes, um, I think they give a more comprehensive view on, on the uh, system. Yeah? Uh, because you get, um, by, by just one calculation, uh, you get um, best modes for different uh, products. Yeah? So energy pH. Sorry? Yeah. But the flight mode is, is fine, yeah? Yeah, there's, there's, I can see eight people now just turning their phones off. There's a big sign on the door asking for everybody to turn their phones off because of this issue. So you can be aware of that, would be great. Yeah, should we turn it completely off or is flight mode? Flight mode's fine. Flight mode is fine. So yeah. I can already see people are receiving text oh, yeah. messages, phone oh. calls, etc. And that is what you need to do. Yeah, thank you for this <laughs> hint. Um, yeah, no, also for different uh, products, then also um, by elementary modes, we can also calculate suboptimal. Also, what is the second best yield, third best yield, and so on. So, um, yeah, no, as I said, um, neither in elementary mode analysis nor in the early papers on uh, linear programming approaches, it, it was claimed that real flux distributions would be predicted, just upper limits. Um, so, and then uh, in the course of time, the results from FBA have been taken more and more for realistic. No? Then they say, yeah, this is a prediction of the living cell. And um, yeah, and there I have some skeptical questions. Um, um, for example, is it really so that some reactions are really not proceeding? No? For example, in this, um, in, uh, this would imply that, um, for example, this, which is fructose bisphosphatase, uh, is not working, it's not operative, no? because. Uh, um, if it were operative, then there would always be some waste of ATP. But um, in some cells it's true, but in many cells uh, we observe this uh, cycle. It's still not so clear why it's operative. Uh, there is one hypothesis that it, for regulation, because it allows a very sensitive regulation, or maybe for heat production, uh, uh, for example, in some insects, uh, that they heat up their muscles, their, their flight muscles, and so um, Yeah, or I mean, we can avoid this by including more uh, constraints. No? If, if you, um, for example, lower limits on the fluxes or some other constraints, then, um, yeah, as, as uh, the group of Pastoising wrote, um, the more constraints we include, uh, 
the more elementary modes are included in the, in the linear combination of the observed flux distribution. And then, of course, we can include so many elementary modes that finally all enzymes are used. Uh, but for me, it's a bit question, is it then really a, a, a nice model if we have so many site constraints and so many parameters? Um, yeah, because, uh, because originally we started uh, by saying um, we don't know um, uh, everything about the cell, so we don't know all the maximal velocities and so, and then we wanted to have a, a minimal approach, so to speak, where we only use the information we have. But now by including more and more site constraints, then we still, uh, then we again have the original situation where we uh, say, yeah, we don't know all this. Now, yeah, uh, some skeptical remarks. Um, so then, um, I don't have so much about FBA of uh, 45. Yeah, I have some more, some more minutes. Now. But anyway, I don't have so much about FBA of microbial communities. Um, um, again, one simple example. Uh, this was, for example, observed in E. coli that um, uh, some strain of E. coli consumes glucose and uh, excretes acetate, so it's f essentially fermentation. And the other strain takes up acetate and uh, respires it down to carbon dioxide and water. So it's a nice example of uh, the division of labor. And um, or here is a more complicated. Um, uh, example from a um, paper, um, I think Costas Maranas is the uh, senior author, uh, is a very strange, uh, cyan or, or very, or let's say interesting, because it's uh, not so well studied, cyanobacterium um, living in symbiosis with a haptophyte alga. And um, yeah, I like this picture because it shows that uh, it takes really uh, up a lot of uh, substances from the host. No, also all the, or a lot of amino acids, but also glyoxylate and so, also all the light blue substances are taken up. So we have an exchange of metabolites. And um, yeah, then uh, importantly, um, uh, if we model such communities, we should of course um, consider the different volumes or proportionally the different biomasses. Uh, uh, but this is the same as when modeling two compartments. Ne? If we uh, take mitochondria and cytosol, we should also uh, consider the different volumes. And then either we can multiply the concentrations by the volumes, or we take the mole numbers rather than concentrations, but it's actually equivalent ne? because volume times concentration gives mole number. Uh, uh, the most important problem is how to define the objective function. Uh, uh, also, irrespective of uh, uh, rate versus yield, but here it's even more complicated because we have, let's say we take rate, um, but even then it's complicated because which rate do we take? Ne? The, the growth rate of the one organism or the other or a linear combination of both. And so as a somehow we have to, to combine the objective functions and, um, and this touches on uh, very basic problems in evolutionary biology um, because um, we should have, uh, uh, I think we should avoid group selection uh, um, because each of them has its own function. Okay, maybe if they are very t um, closely, very tightly linked by, for example, mutual cross-feeding, then we can consider both of them, also the entire community together as one super organism, so to speak, and then we can um, calculate or we can maximize uh, the overall growth rate. Um, yeah, and um, uh, different approaches were, um, have been uh, suggested in the literature. Uh, for example, in this paper by Stolja, uh, they took a just a linear combination of the two growth rates. Um, we can, of course, normalize the, the weighting coefficients that the sum equals one or that the one of them is one. And so if, and if we now change uh, one of these um, coefficients, then it can be shown that it's equivalent to going along the Pareto front. Ne? If we have a multi-criteria optimization, but this is, of course, a different or a, yeah, a, also a large topic. I mean, could speak a lot about uh, this Pareto um, uh, maximization, and then you have this Pareto front, and then you go along this. Uh, so um, it, it is, uh, problem becomes easier when 
Um, two species do a mutual cross-feeding. If they really uh, exchange, for example, one amino acid and the other gives some, some other amino acid back, um, because then it's clear that they uh, must grow with equal growth rates. Then it's easy. No? Then they have the same growth rate. Um, because uh, if one of them grew faster than the other one, then at some point it would be limited by this amino acid. Or if this grew faster, then it would be limited by that. So therefore, finally, they must reach the same growth rate. So then we just take this as an objective function. Um, when the two species compete for the same substrate, this can also occur, of course, um, then sometimes all the equal growth rates uh, are assumed with the um, justification that if one of them were larger, it would outcompete the other one. You know, so this would grow faster. So finally, this would die out. So then we cannot observe. Also if we really observe coexistence of two species, then they must have more or less the same uh, growth rate. Uh, interestingly, uh, equal growth rates can also be assumed in this case, which I showed before, if we have a feedback inhibition, which is often the case, you know, for example, acetate or ethanol at larger concentrations inhibits the growth of this one. And therefore, uh, this organism is dependent also on this one. So that this takes away the acetate. Um, um, in a game theoretical description, and I will speak about that tomorrow, um, this can be uh, described as the leader and this as the follower. And um, yeah, and then, of course, they must also have the same growth rate, finally, no, because uh, otherwise um, this would be limited by uh, acetate. Yeah, uh, so this is already my last slide. Um, and yeah, I, I must apologize. I had some technical problems with my laptop, therefore I could not prepare an acknowledgement slide. And so, but of course, I acknowledge the funding agencies like Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and also uh, several corporation partners. Uh, yeah, I've, and finally, I want to show you this um, um, uh, reference. Um, it's actually by the Toysink Group in Amsterdam, um, uh, which is really a, it's, it's already five years ago or six years ago, but really a nice review I can uh, recommend uh, on constraint based modeling um, of microbial communities. And I took some of the ideas um, from that paper. Yeah, then thank you very much, and I'm curious to hear your questions. Yeah, yeah, also, it's, uh, of course, not always true that they have equal growth rates. Um, maybe it's a bit wishful thinking because then it makes uh, FBA approaches easier for these communities. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, in many cases it's not so. And yeah, and then it's an, an open question um, uh, how to. Um, uh, yeah, also what should be then taken as the objective function as a linear combination, as I showed, and um, also Costas Marana suggested something else, uh, but I uh, must confess I have forgotten the details. He considered an overall uh, function for the entire community with some side constraints taking into account the individual growth rates. Uh, so there are several uh, approaches out there. Uh, yeah, I, I, I also read the paper by Ines Thiele, but I forgot this uh, suggestion, but probably it's also, yeah, there's uh, yeah, several um, suggestions out there. Um, so I had a quick question. I was slightly confused by something. Hmm. Um, so you're saying it was two constraints correspond to maximizing growth, one constraint to yield. Yeah, also, um, yeah, that, uh, probably I simplified it too much. Of course, we cannot say it, whenever there are two constraints, then it's a maximization of rate, uh, of course, appropriately chosen uh, constraints. Yeah, and but we need uh, we need at least two appropriately chosen constraints. Yeah, but if you have only one constraint constraint, then I think we can never um, maximize rate when we start off with this ratio. Uh, Yeah, um, also for me, this still is an open question. So, and, uh, yeah, actually, it's a very good question, of course, then. Um, maybe this would be um, 
worth a paper yeah, to, to analyze really how should constraints be chosen uh, to maximize yield and how should they uh, take to maximize weight. I, I think, uh, um, although I don't agree with all the assertions in that paper, uh, but I think a good paper for that is this paper by Stefan Klamt. Uh, also there, uh, they, uh, also it, it involves a lot of mathematics. Um, and they also had an illustrative example, which is a bit more complicated than mine about respiration and fermentation. But um, essentially, they also say that uh, uh, if we have upper limits on, on at least two rates, um, then, then we can, yeah, then we can have this overflow metabolism, so to speak. And um, yeah, and they also show then. Uh, how to maximize yield. Uh, yeah, but I must confess, I don't know all the details. But yeah, as a, then I recommend that paper. Um, Yeah, this is, of course, also an important question. Uh, also, probably it's imp uh, it has optimized something, uh, or, or even that is doubted uh, to some extent. Uh, but as a starting from the from the Darwinian view, no? the survival of the fittest, no? the fittest is the optimized. But, but the question is, what means fittest? No? Also, what is the criterion? Uh, and yeah, and this is actually, as I said, a heavy debate: is uh, is it yield or rate which is maximized, or maybe some other stability or controllability or so? Uh, and uh, yeah, in all these optimization approaches, uh, the crux is first to find the, the appropriate optimality criterion. Um, but from the game theoretical point of view, one could even uh, say m maybe it's not optimal, uh, like in the prisoner's dilemma. No? We, we could say yeah, it, it would be better for both of them to use uh, respiration, but they don't. No? Therefore, may maybe even that is not clear whether there is something has been optimized. And yeah, and actually, um, I was uh, thinking again about your question. Um, maybe it's too harsh to say. Um, um, rate is not maximized. Uh, I think also in the first approach, um, because if we normalize, then we have only the numerator, and then mathematically it's then a linear combination of rates, so in that sense we maximize rate. Uh, but then uh, uh, I think then it's, it, it, as I showed with this example, then it's actually, um, then it's equivalent. No? As a, here, as a, this optimal solution maximizes yield and rate at the same time. No? So the ATP, yeah, if this, yeah, if this is set equal to unity or equal to some constant, then, um, yeah, in the optimal situation, both ATP per time and ATP per mole of glucose is maximized. Uh, so in some cases, this, um, this does not contradict each other, so to speak. Whereas with these side constraints, then um, uh, they contradict each other. Then maximizing yield is not the same as maximizing rate. So therefore, maybe I should say, uh, um, with these two constraints, did I? Yeah, at, um, at least two equality constraints are needed. This, is a, a con also this applies to cases where um, Maximization of yield and maximization of rate contradict each other. Yeah, also, so I would say maximization of rate at suboptimal yields. Yeah, but it's really complicated. I, uh, I've thought about it a long time and I'm still, I'm still not at the end of my <laughs> considerations. Uh, so there are several questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Watson in this 1986 paper, he spoke about minimizing the free energy cost, but this is probably uh, equivalent. Uh, so this would be a thermodynamic interpretation. 
Something like stability or adaptability. Oh, no, no, as if it's FPA, and no, I think we cannot uh, maximize stability uh, or adaptability. Yeah. This would then require other approaches. Uh, the only things which are proportional, so to speak, like free energy yeah. or so. And mm. now you, you, you maximize the notion of the observation of the Also, yeah, yeah. Um, also optimization is either maximization or minimization, which is finally mathematically equivalent because we can uh, uh, invert the sign. Um, yeah, and in that sense, optimization. I, I mean, yeah, probably optimization uh, has a bit more of a meaning uh, because it has a, a, it involves some interpretation. Uh, maximization is just a mathematical term, so we yeah. we maximize some function, um, but optimization also has an interpretation that it's optimal for the organism, so it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is actually the, the big question. Eh? What, what, what is the optimality criterion? Yeah. And uh, often this, uh, as, as, uh, sometimes pe people hope to, to derive this from some first principles, maybe second law of thermodynamics or so, but I think this hope was not fulfilled. So um, also often these optimality criteria are rather uh, explained by plausibility arguments. Ne? Uh, it also uh, concerns other uh, applications. For example, we also <laughs> dealt with uh, um, problem of blood flow, um, also more biophysical research. Uh, so what is the optimal blood, um, for example, optimal um, um, hematocrit. Ne? Hematocrit is the volume ratio of red blood cells. If it's too low, then not enough oxygen can be bound. If it's too high, then the blood is too viscous, so it flows very slowly. So and there's an optimum, which is about 40%, which is an interesting question, why it's just 40%. So and then um, we said now probably the as a plausible assumption that the oxygen transport rate is maximized, yeah, but we, there is no real physical um, justification for it, but I think it's rather plausible. But maybe somebody else says, no, it's not plausible, we should take some other <laughs> optimality criterion. Yeah. This is often a problem that there is no uh, yeah, strict proof that this is the right optimality criterion. <laughs> uh, I would say, biologically speaking, many cells, even the examples you gave, E. coli, Cerevisia, Lisa, they actually switch over time. So they optimize at different time points, either the yield or the rate. They start by very, very strong fermentation. Mm. They secrete all the ethanol, and then they switch to respiration. So you can think of it as yeah. something that is. Set of yeah, there is this dioxic shift. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Also, of course, I, due to time constraints, I couldn't mention all these things. Um, um, but my interpretation would be different. I would not say that they switch from high rate to high yield. Um, I think the reason is that, um, um, oh, yeah, I can also argue. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think a major cause is that. Um, they first um, poison the competitors ne, by ethanol, <laughs> and then if the others are all dead, then they can take up the ethanol again. And uh, also then uh, and, and another uh, second cause could be if the glucose is depleted, then they don't have any other resource, then they have to take the, the ethanol. So I think this would be uh, uh, two good justifications for this behavior, but maybe uh, the high yield <laughs> would be a third uh, uh, explanation. You know. But uh, uh, but um, this reminds me also to the fact we have discussed it already over coffee that probably not all cells um, um, maximize growth rate. For example, our cells in our body, uh, no, they, they are not proliferating all the time. So therefore, I think this um, uh, uh, maximal rate um, uh, reasoning is more applicable to, to highly proliferating bacteria no, like E. coli or or maybe fungi, uh, but even not all bacteria do that. No? There are bacteria in the deep sea or in the soil or so, which divide relatively slowly, which is also surprising. Um, uh, so therefore, there are a lot of, of open questions. <laughs> what I want to ask is, is the solution for this system to have multiple solutions 
try to make it into a dynamical system that is not at steady state. We continuously saw the changing environment, for a changing environment, mm. how the transition would be from fermentation to respiration, when it would be correct to, to move from that from fermentation to respiration. Mm. The set of steady states that we need to solve. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, this would be also a good idea to, if the conditions change, no, then to uh, look for new steady states. Uh, yeah, I don't know in which sequence <laughs> the rents, hands were raised. <laughs> yeah, I think every time for dynamic actuators. Yeah? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, but then the optimality condition doesn't change. I, I excluded this as all, also for time constraints. Uh, yeah, maybe for time constraints. and. Yeah, there are so many uh, extensions, um, uh, regulatory FBA and FBA with macromolecular crowding. Um, this is really a huge field. So actually, when I was asked by Rosalind Allen to give this talk, I was first hesitant. I said, oh, FBA is such a large topic. But then I said, okay, I can at least try. <laughs> yeah, I think you raised your hand already very early. <laughs> About what? About delta. What delta do we need to like know to distinguish between these different model elements? Distinguish between the different types of FBA or, or in comparison to elementary modes or so you, you have modeling assumptions on the flux theory. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Um, now, yeah, for, um, for, uh, for example, uh, we need data for this um, um, coefficients, no? also, uh, especially in the, uh, if you're uh, interested in the biomass, uh, also optimization of biomass yield or rate. <laughs> um, no? uh, there is a rather long linear combination, C1, V1 plus C2, V2, and so on. No? And for this, we need uh, uh, data for this uh, C, CJ coefficients. Um, but I explained in my talk that could be taken either from the trimass or from the genome. Um, and now yeah, then um, also this, uh, yeah, for example, here these upper uh, rates, no, also, uh, maximal velocities. Uh, and actually, um, I mentioned this flux balance analysis with macromolecular crowding. Uh, or, or we could, could also call it uh, resource allocation models. Uh, actually, we, we applied this also to explain the Warburg effect. But actually, the, that fermentation is used uh, in, uh, rather than respiration is also part of the Warburg effect ne, in, in cancer cells. And this can be nicely explained, uh, but, but one needs a little bit more um, mathematics, namely uh, then these upper uh, limits are not taken as constants, but they are proportional to the to the enzyme costs, and then this, uh, the sum of all costs is constant. Also, in a, in a sense, so to speak, a linear combination of these maximal velocities is set uh, uh, constant. And then, but this uh, cell can uh, allocate resources either to respiration or to fermentation. And this uh, uh, nicely, uh, okay, okay, it also needs some side constraints, but um, depending then on the parameters of the constraints, we get either pure fermentation or respiro fermentation or pure respiration. Uh, this approach I like very much. Um, so therefore, yeah, in, we have really used FBA. I think this is one of the success stories of FBA that this um, Warburg effect or other types of overflow metabolism can can be explained, but uh, with an extension, namely this. Uh, also it's called macromolecular crowding because, uh, for example, in the mitochondrial membrane, there is a crowding of uh, proteins, but this is just one explanation. We could also, in general, say it's some protein costs. Mm. Yeah, so then, uh, again, the question of data. <laughs> also, in principle, we need a lot of data, for example, to to quantify the costs in the mitochondrial membrane, but uh, we did it in just in a qualitative way. We didn't take any data. We just said respiration is more costly than fermentation, uh, which is certainly true. And this explains nicely um, this um, you know, respiro fermentation. Okay, if there are no more questions, then we'll have audience questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
can actually also be reproduced if you, you know, include sodium allocation. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is probably quite analog to the bulb of the figure you're just talking about. Yeah, right? yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I feel still needs a question open. Um, how much investigation do you do first to be sure what kind of objective function you want to use? Yeah. I still find that, I don't know, it seems like maybe that's a hard question to yes, yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, often it, they are just written ad hoc, so to speak, a priori, uh, some function, and then uh, we can see whether it works or so. No? But uh, often these, um, yeah, as I said, the objective functions are not really well explained. So it's more yeah, plausibility arguments. No? They are um, probably then, yeah, uh, the model will give some outcome which is not consistent with with the observations, and then it's not published. Therefore, we don't see it. <laughs> no, so we only the published papers only <laughs> involve those uh, uh, um, optimality criteria which were successful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> optimality of the optimality criteria, no. meta optimality. <laughs> based on whether it works or not, right? So you're like, ah, oh, this, let's assume this is a criterion, then does it work? So you choose it like, so you yeah, I think this is what often is done. It, uh, it's not so discussed in detail in the, the paper, is, the but is yeah. the, like, the research question would be, what is the optimality criterion? Mm. And then you use FDA to find an answer to that question. Do you think that's like an appropriate way or is it like... Yeah, yeah, there, there are... Uh, for example, there is a, a good paper by uh, the group of Uwe Sauer in Zurich, uh, where they uh, compared uh, several, um, this was, I think, about these gene deletion experiments. Ne? And then they compared FBA with Room and MoMA and I think some other criterion or even more. Um, yeah, and then they showed which, is, which uh, gives the best predictions. Yeah. This was done already, but probably it's um, so you uh, always by trial and error, so to speak, you take a criterion and look what comes out. It probably it's more difficult to reverse engineer the optimality criteria, and this I didn't think it's not possible so far. Yeah, thank you too for the discussion.